Taylor. Uh, Jacob is a joint appointment in the uh, National Institute of Science and Technology, this, and in the University of Maryland. Uh, he uh, graduated from Harvard in 2006, right? uh, after which he was a Papalardo fellow at MIT. Uh, he's uh, won several very distinguished awards, including uh, the Presidential Early Career Award. Um, uh, the Samuel Entertainment Service for America Medal and the Institute of uh, no, sorry, the International Union for Pure and Applied Physics for your award. And uh, currently, in addition to his academic work, uh, he's also the assistant director for one information science in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So, with that, um, I'd like to welcome Jay to the you're about exploring one weather with lights. Please switch the lights off. I'm yes. afraid I'll fall asleep. So I think I'll keep it that way. <laughs> it would uh, it'll be my pleasure Let's go. to keep you entertained okay. with the lights out as well as with the lights on. But I think it might be easier to see some of the pretty pictures. Some of the colors, particularly, might be hard to. Uh, I appreciate it. Well, so, I unfortunately do not have a good uh, soundtrack to go with this movie, but there is. Yes, there we go. So, it's a great pleasure to be here. I have never been to the tech community before. So, first of all, I want to thank my hosts, uh, Shmuel, and uh, uh, to provide such a great opportunity talk with you today about some of the work that I and my group have been participating in for the last several years. I'm at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gettysburg, Maryland, and I am jointly appointed at the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. <clears throat> and so I also received many jokes about superpositions of location, which are separated by about 30 kilometers. I also am the co-director for the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science. And so part of my work is focused not just on the physics side, but connecting what we're doing within physics to advances occurring now in computer science and how it impacts physics using the lens of quantum information. That's a lot of broad concepts to get across. I do want to start off by telling you a little bit where I'm coming from so that you can understand my perspective on the problems that I'm most interested in. In particular, I come from the field of quantum information science, and most of my career has been focused on a concept which we now call quantum information technology. Quantum information essentially provides a set of, a set of promises, ensured by what we know about quantum mechanics. So insofar as quantum mechanics is the correct microscopic theory that describes the low energy physics around us, we can make strong inferences about several technological applications from that basic insight. One of them is in measurement. Quantum mechanics tells us very important things about what can and cannot be measured, and what the consequences of measurement are. It also has showed us that this single part of the picture of measurement has to be supplemented with entanglement to properly understand what happens when you measure many things at once. And that using entanglement can provide new opportunities in sensing, both in terms of how much bandwidth you have, how sensitive you can be. It also may help us understand a little bit better what this entanglement thing is all about. You use quantum sensors in your daily life, like when you hire a taxi by using your smartphone, in the form of an atomic clock that runs our GPS system. You use atomic sensors, you use quantum sensors, when you go skiing and tear a ligament in your knee and have a doctor examine your knee using magnetic resonance imaging. I point out these two examples because these are old quantum revolution 1.0 technologies. But you couldn't have anticipated in 1954 that your atomic clock concept would translate into 
the decimation of the taxi industry in 2006. You couldn't anticipate a whole new industry of healthcare arising from looking at the individual nuclei in a small molecule back in 1946. But just because you couldn't anticipate that that would be the outcome, you could tell it would be some outcome. And so a lot of the excitement in the other aspects that I've talked about today, mostly in quantum simulation, but also communication and computation, arise because we know that there are applications. They may not be the killer apps that we actually have in 30 years, but we know that there are going to be some very important applications. So we do know some things, but they may not be the ones that dominate down the line. In quantum communication, essentially, you're using and distributing entanglement to enable new communication tasks. In quantum simulation, you're implementing arbitrary Hamilton. So I'm not going to go into more detail on that one because the rest of the talk is about quantum simulation. You want to hear more about that right now. I'll talk about it in a moment. I do want to bring up, though, general purpose quantum information processing, which has been made most famous by the advent of Shor's algorithm, an algorithm for factor of very large numbers, which breaks modern crypto systems. This vertical hierarchy also represents a complexity hierarchy from sort of easiest, already established technology to technology you can kind of buy, to technology that people are running in laboratories around the world, to technology that we're dreaming about building in the 10 to 20 year horizon. This interesting package of science and then technology that it enables, of course, also brings up a very important question that we rarely grapple with, but that we're now having to start to grapple with, which is what are the consequences for us as a civilization, as a society, of these advances. And the most prominent example of an inconsequence that's emerging right now is what's called post-quantum cryptography. The crypto system that underlies your e-commerce is not secure to attack against a quantum computer. Think of how large e-commerce is as part of the gross domestic product of any given nation at the present time. So we have to develop new crypto systems, which are robust against such quantum attacks. These are called post-quantum crypto systems. And this is already happening, at least within the US government, through a process that NIST, my home institution, started two years ago. We have an open competition for all the different post-quantum crypto standards, and some implementations. In fact, in Google Chrome browser, for example, you can turn on post-quantum crypto. Not that most web servers enable it, but it's an interesting time. And a lot of what we take for granted in our crypto infrastructure is going to change as a consequence of what's happening in the scientific community. I just point this out to let you know that these are momentous times. And change is on the horizon. Now, let's take this broad scale policy type story, this broad scale technology type story, and let's zoom in on some very interesting physics that can illuminate our understanding of the natural world. This is the physics behind the flow of quantum simulation. Who here has tried to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, the equation that describes fluid dynamics? Was it easy? No. So, you know, famously, the Navier-Stokes equation is actually quite hard. If you can solve it, you think you get, was it $10 million in the clay institute? $1 million. $1 million in the clay institute. Of course, Tari Tao has recently showed a variant of Navier-Stokes is MP hard. So it's probably not solvable. But what do we do in practice? Well, we build approximation methods with computers, classical computers. And we test our approximation methods with analog devices. This is an example of a wind tunnel, where I have a model of a vehicle. I look at its performance under literal wind going by. And that can be used to update my approximation methods and my classical computing approaches to handling that problem. Another really hard equation is Schrodinger's equation. Hilbert space is vast. Every additional degree of freedom I add to Hilbert space is an exponential growth of that Hilbert space. If you think of the possible states of one bit versus two versus three, you see it's growing exponentially in the number of bits. So exact solution of Schrodinger's equation, or numerical solution of Schrodinger's equation, is usually an exercise in futility for the arbitrary problem. Schrodinger's equation, the arbitrary case, is very hard. So what can you do? Well, you can use very good intuition, physics intuition, from renormalization group, from vector field theory, 
from advances in chemistry and advances in material science in order to find classical approximations of the quantum mechanics problem. Density functional theory, various variational ensemble approaches. How do you make those better? You need to test them against an analog model. Quantum simulation is, in some sense, the analog model system used to test your personal physics intuition and your computer's classical algorithms intuition. So when we talk about quantum simulation, I want you to think about wind tunnels. Maybe it's not the sexiest way to put it, but that's what it looks like practically. It's a key enabler of our understanding of quantum computers. The bulk of today's talk is going to be focused on a very easy regime for quantum simulation. And to understand what I mean by easy, I'm going to invoke a typical piece of Americana, lionizing our criminals, right? In particular, Willie Sutton was a bank robber, quite a famous bank robber in the 1950s. And he was asked why he robbed the banks. And he quipped, because that's where the money is. Well, I'm not going to rob banks, but I am going to do quantum simulation in the microwave domain, primarily. And then, because that's where the nonlinear is. A linear system, a linear classical system, is actually easy to solve quantum mechanics. So it doesn't satisfy this hardness assumption I made about Turing's equation. It's a very special case. So I need some sort of nonlinear, something that's not bilinear in bosonic and fermionic operators in order to make things interesting. And then since my main bosons are going to be photons, excitation is much magnetic field, I need something that makes them interact. In the microwave domain, we have that. That's a Joseph injunction. But let's recall what we mean by a microwave domain photon. In particular, and I, I, I apologize, some of these slides I prepared actually in the plane ride over, I did not bring my laptop. And so I started scribbling badly on my iPad, thinking that, you know, I wanted to really get this concept across. So I apologize if my handwriting is imperfect. But I want to recall for you a very prototypical optics concept, which is the fabric pure resonator, two mirrors with an optical field in between. And we know that this supports standing wave solutions of electromagnetic. It can also be done in the microwave domain. So Richard Roche, his Nobel Prize winning work was done using fabric pro style cavities built for the microwave domain, superconducting mirrors. How would you describe this as an electrical circuit? Well, you might move to a picture of an inductance and a capacitance. So here is a typical LC inductor capacitor resonator, tank circuit, as it's sometimes called. That's actually a pretty good approximation to this object from the sense of the excitations of the system. It has, at this island up here, not the, here's ground and here's the island. At the island, you have some number of charges. And then you have the time integral of the voltage, which is the thing called the EMF of flux. These two variables, in quantum mechanical sense, are conjugate variables to each other. The flux acts as a position variable. The charge acts as a momentum variable. And their commutation relation is exactly what you expect, IH bar. What is the energy stored in this object? Well, I have energy on the capacitor. That's the charge squared divided by twice the capacitance. Right? That's how much it costs to load that many charges on that capacitor. What's the energy of the inductor? Well, it's the EMF squared divided by twice the inductance. It's the flux through the inductor squared divided by twice the inductance. Momentum squared plus position squared as a Hamiltonian gives us a harmonic oscillator. The excitations of this resonant circuit, I'm going to call photons. I'm going to call them photons even if the circuit is made of metal. Because they represent solutions to Maxwell's equations in the presence of the boundary conditions provided by metal. And the photons are the normal mode solutions of that Maxwell's equations in whatever medium they sit, be it a dielectric or a metal. If it's a metal, there's going to be some loss. There's going to be some resistance. That's going to change from pure quantum mechanics to something else. So I'm going to sidestep that to a large extent. I'm going to superconductors. And then here's an example of a superconducting resonator, where the resistance is basically removed. It's a little bit hard to see, so I apologize for that. I'm going to zoom in right in here. This is a ground plane. 
in the ground plane, and then there's a center line conductor that has a gap. That's a little capacitor that couples the incoming transmission line to this wending and winding path of the center line. And then there's another capacitor on the other side. This capacitor capacitor bounded segment of transmission line forms resonances. It's a transmission line is a way to compact the photons in the transverse dimensions into a very compact object, as anyone who's used a coaxial cable knows. Right? A coaxial cable is able to take kilometer-long photons and put them in something that's a few millimeters in diameter. And if anyone's not immediately shocked by that, obviously you can do too much physics. Right? It's, it's amazing. And it, what does it, of course, is the central line conductor that allows me to solution some Maxwell's equations that aren't wavelength-wide in the transverse dimensions. So a nice consequence of doing this is that I can get actually very high energy densities for single photons. And we're going to leverage that in one problem. We're going to be able to really work at high effective electric fields or high voltages without having more than one photon in the system. So this small load volume leading to large electric field for photons is going to be great. Superconducting material is going to be great. That's going to keep our losses down. It's going to let it stay quantum for a long period of time. We have this inductor. Um, that inductor is not nonlinear. Right? I got a harmonic oscillator. That is a dagger a that's a bilinear in those on operators. That's not nonlinear. I need something nonlinear. So what am I going to use? I'm going to use this little box rendered beautifully in PowerPoint with beer bubbles, I guess, uh, which has a, an X in here. That, that box is a Joseph conjunction. It is a capacitance and a nonlinear inductance put together. That nonlinear inductance is described not by a phi squared, but by the cosine of the flux difference on either side of this junction in units of the quantum of flux. Now, there's some amazing physics going into this cosine. Bardeen famously got it wrong and was pretty um, vehemently against Brian Josephine's result when it first came out. Because he did a calculation for single particle tunneling. Josephine just assumed that Kuhn pairs would, would tunnel as a pair, which turned out to be an unjustified but correct assumption. And Bardeen, a year later, was able to justify the assumption. And he came back to the man called and said, You were right. So this cosine phi, that's just the object that represents quantum tunneling of Cooper pairs. It's the object that increments the number of Cooper pairs on an island by one, or decrements the number of Cooper pairs on the island by one. When the fluctuations, quantum fluctuations of this flux variable are small, you can see that I can expand the cosine. And the first non-trivial term is the phi squared term of the Taylor expansion of this cosine. You'll recognize that this phi squared and this Phi squared look the same. So because this is what we call a nonlinear inductor. Its small angle fluctuations look like an inductance. And then you can think about a series of these phi's. But you might forget that it is in fact 2 pi periodic. And the 2 pi periodicity arises from charge conservation. The fact that the number of group pairs is an integer value on an island. So really what you have here is not quantizations of harmonic oxide, but quantizations of the potential. So if you think about Joseph conjunctions, I want you to think of pendulum. That's great, right? Because pendular are interesting. Much more interesting than just from my oscillator. So what is the sort of typical example we use today? It's what's called a transform. This is the pendulum in unit in the small excursion limit. So you know the pendulum in the small excursion limit is a harmonic oscillator. There's here's my pendular on, moving back and forth. And if you look here, this black curve represents the potential energy as a function of the angle of phi. This green curve here is the ground state wave function, typical for the transmon scenario. It's pretty tightly confined near the bottom of the pendulum motion. So here's my pendulum going back and forth. The Hamiltonian is the charging energy times the number of Cooper pairs squared. That's this capacitance term. Remember, this number here, which, uh, sorry, let me get division signs, q divided by 2e, that's the pendulum of angular momentum. Over here is the potential energy of this object, right? That's the cosine that you expect from a real pendulum. 
And so in this regime, what I have is a system that's largely linear with a sort of quartic nonlinear correction from the phi. And this works beautifully. It does a bunch of interesting things. For example, if there's a phase slip, you wanted to have a phase difference between the left side and the right side, it doesn't know about it because there's no wave function at the, at the boundaries. This makes the transmon qubit extremely insensitive to electric fields. Because electric fields are the thing that drive the phase slip on the suspected pendulum. Now that sounds a little counterintuitive, like electric fields and phase slips, you think I might be more of a magnetic field. But we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail. But I just want to remind you that when we're talking about this, we're really talking about sort of pendular excitations. And then if you have some you know, deeper goals, which is coupling of the, di the dipole produced by this pendulum to a cavity, then you want to look at this parameter, which represents how strong the single photon electric field is in units of the electric dipole coupling, compared to the actual resonance frequency of the photon themselves. And I chose this quantity because it's very easy to remember the formula for it. It has a simple physical interpretation. In particular, this ratio is given by the square root of the fine structure constant, which is what we expect, right? That's the coupling constant of electromagnetism. Then I express the dipole element. So let me just go back to the slide. This thing here, right? That's a dipole antenna. It's a dipole antenna with, uh, in this case, an inductive element in the middle. And that dipole antenna can be sit inside a cavity and it produces a dipole coupling given by the dipole antenna's dipole in units of divide, divided by a Bohr dipole, electric charge of electron times the Bohr radius. And then there's another three factor, which is the ratio of the wavelength of the light times the Bohr radius squared divided by the volume in which the electromagnetic field is stored. This is called the moon volume. So this tells you really how, if you want to make this coupling large, as it occurs in circuit community, how you do it. Uh, by the way, um, this will be for the near end of the talk. If you want to use the magnetic for dipoles instead of electric dipoles, it's higher order in the theory of uh, uh, QED, so you get another factor of fine structure constant. That's awfully expensive. That's 137 times weaker. Plus, making here making a large electric dipole just means making a big dipole antenna, eight pieces of metal. Making a large magnetic dipole is much harder, at least in the quantum domain. So that makes this ratio hard to drive. Um, this part here is about the same. So what do you do if you want to make this strong? Well, you can decrease the volume. How do we do that? Remember, we use superconducting materials, central line conductors, very high electric field densities. You can increase the dipole moment, have these two capacitive paths, make them further apart, makes a bigger dipole. You can also try and decouple the magnetic electric fields using inductors and capacitors separately, lumped elements, rather than <coughs> transmission elements. I'm not going to do that so much. So this is, by the way, an example of the evolution of dipoles. Here is a small dipole set in the original silicon experiments with the transmodal qubit. And then they made, this is five microns now, and they made something here it is a sort of a 300 micron long object that is a much bigger antenna that they've been building. So these are kind of the approaches that you start to, start to explore. Now what's amazing about these systems is that this ratio here, come in the order of 0.01 to even 0.1. So you're getting scenarios where this vacuum round the is so much larger than any other scale to the resonance frequency itself. What that's going to allow us to do in this case is going to let us probe many body systems with less than a single proton into reasonably large effective amplitude of field. Okay, so let's now take this transmon and let's make it more exciting. Physics in there. I'm going to go from a single pendulum to something that does more. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add two more Joseph conjunctions. So I make a loop. Right, this loop can now have persistent currents in it. It's a superconductor. What is the persistent current? It's a phase slip somewhere on one of these junctions that allows current to circulate around. So this, this phase slip, this persistent current, is a, is a type of vorticity a circulation in the system. And so now we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so exploring vortices. 
and exploring them in a controlled manner so we can actually understand more about them. By the way, for the experts in the audience, this is, of course, just a flux qubit with two capacitive patents attached. And the qubit states of the flux qubit are a clockwise circulating persistent current or counterclockwise circulating persistent current. It's kind of fun, right? We can think about superpositions of current states. And sometimes this is called a macroscopic superposition, but we now understand better that's not really what we like think. That's just, it's more of a spin. So I want to remind you, by the way, what is a vortex, right? It's a circulation of some fluid or field around some core. In, these, in this thing I just showed you, there's some islands, but there's a hole, so it's easy. The core doesn't have to have any density because there's a hole in the system. Um, it has some interesting properties, though. For, for example, if you have a lattice of these things, you get a, because of the continuity of the fluid, this defect actually extends throughout the entire system. It's called the topological defect. Because even though it's a local core, the circulation extends all the way to the edges for the continuity requirements. And it's also very interesting because it, it maps to a very celebrated condensed matter physics model called the XY model, which is represented by compasses on a plane. Here's my little compass arrow. Compass takes a value, an angle between 0 and 2 pi. And they're coupled with their dot product. So, and this compass vector dot this compass vector, which is just the cosine of the angle difference. And you can immediately see why this is so fun for us. Right? Because remember, the Joseph junction has the potential energy given as the cosine of the flux. So, and the flux for islands, for <coughs> quantized, runs from 0 to 2 pi. So we have an implementation of the XY model using these Joseph injunction devices. In the long wavelength limit, this looks like a field. So the low frequency excitations of this thing is just that of a free field. But because of the lattice and because of the cosine, for short range behavior, I can get vortices. So it's a great model for understanding these topological defects. Here is this, here's a single vortex circulating. This is, <clears throat> has this long range flow in a single vortex. That means, by the way, that the energy is actually divergent in the thermodynamic flow. Because it goes all the way up to the end. So you have to have a darn good reason to get a vortex. Now, that being said, if I have two vortices, here's a vortex circulating clockwise, and here's a anti-vortex circulating counterclockwise, or anti-clockwise, you see that the long-range circulation of this vortex is countering the long-range circulation of that vortex. And they have no net circulation along distances, so they don't cause an infinite amount of energy in their magnetic <coughs> So vortex and the vortex pairs as you can put together. Um, you, you find by solving the problem that they have an interaction as if they were coulombic charges with the charge of the vorticity. And it's Coulomb's law in two dimensions, not three. So not one over R, but that's actually a law of R. Now this interaction means that they kind of want to be bound to each other. And I unfortunately don't have this beautiful video of how this leads to things like solitons. But if anyone has takes a dinner plate and goes to the Technion swimming pool, if they, they let you in their dinner plates to the swimming pool, I, I don't know. I got this pass from a guest house saying I can go to the swimming pool. But I, I haven't checked it out. So you take a dinner plate, go to the swimming pool, and you slide the dinner plate through. Now, if you've ever run a piece of material through water, you know that you generate circulation on the sides. They have opposite circulations, and they will co-propagate as a bound object the whole distance of the Olympic length swimming pool in that. That's a beautiful demonstration of how these vortices actually <coughs> <have> the <coughs> of the fluid. Another beautiful demonstration of this is what's called the binding and unbinding transition, mm. or the KKT transition. Uh, and in fact, was the subject of the Nobel Prize recently. So, to remember this vortex anti vortex pair is not infinitely costly, right? You can pay finite energy cost to get it. So, at low temperatures, you do get a few of these because they cost some energy, but they also have some entropy. They have a number of possible positions they can go. But because they're bound to each other, they each, each pair acts as kind of one degree of freedom. 
at some point, the temperature is high enough that the entropic benefit of unbinding those vortices, taking that one degree of freedom and making it two, exceeds the energy cost that you get. So the number is still you have an even an equal number of vortices and anti-vortices, but they're no longer attached to each other. And this transition from the pairing to the unpairing case is, is a, actually a topological phase transition. There's no local order plan for it. But it actually represents so, a very novel type of phase transition. We're going to come back to this concept. I'll just mention it now because it's, of course, just such a beautiful idea. Now, instead of thermally adding vortices in, there's nothing else I can do to make those vortices want to exist. I can frustrate the system. So rather than having it be the dot product of adjacent compasses, I can put a rotation between one compass to the next and the dot. So I add the rotation angle A, which will be a function of the location of the, of the link between the two objects. If this field has a curl, Then, when I try, so here, here's the example case of trying to, for example, satisfy the links vertically with uh, some overall curl in it. So this, this field, and this has some rotation, but these do not, these do not. This has more rotation, this is more rotation. So this would be satisfying all the vertical links, but not the horizontal links. So these, this line here is satisfying the horizontal links, but this line is not, and this line is not, because they want to be lined up. And it turns out that with the curl, there's no way for me to satisfy all of the links. There's frustration in the system. So what happens is some of these have to go against the preferred energetics of some of their links in order to reduce the energetics of other of their links. This frustration problem produces vortices. As you can see here, this is an example of a vortex, there's a circulation. So in our Equivalent case, remember the Joseph junction is Cooper pair tunnel hopping across the boundary. A charged object making a translation picks up a phase proportional to the line integral of the vector potential. That's the parallel space. So the consequence is that if I take this system and I put an external magnetic field, the flux penetrating through this loop shows up in my overall energy landscape. Here's the cosine from this cosine from this, and then here is the one from this last link that closes the loop, and that picks up this integrated magnetic flux through the loop. So magnetic field for my lattice of Joseph injunction systems is equivalent to this frustration parameter in this xy line. Magnetic field wants to introduce forces. How, do, how does it actually show up? So here is the two-dimensional energy landscape of this potential. There's this overall flux between the left pad and the right pad, and then there's the flux between the left pad and this island right here. So at, at no external magnetic field, you see that I have a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. It's not symmetric, there's, there's different, two different plasma frequencies. One representing some of the low frequency oscillations, one representing high frequency oscillations. As I go near pi flux, I get a lower energy circulation here, which is a clockwise overall persistent current, or slightly higher than pi, a counterclockwise persistent current. And right at pi, I have the degeneracy. And that's the, the flux cube machine. So this is kind of how you translate uh, these cosine terms into an energy landscape. And then what we recognize is that solutions of this energy landscape represent a vortex-like solution, either here no vortices, here one vortex, here one anti-vortex. And we define the vort vorticity of the system via the circulation. That you can so I'm not doing that here. I just want to let you know that really vortices are just some sort of local minima of this energy landscape. <clears throat> okay, so now you can say, great, let's just go beyond two, let's go to 10,000. Okay, and in the 1990s, there was actually substantial effort by many groups. I'm highlighting your Hans Moyes effort because that was probably in the end, the, the, uh, one of the earliest, but also the most robust, where they would make large arrays of islands coupled with Joseph conjunctions, big two-dimensional arrays of these things, in order to understand more about the X1. This is early quantum simulation. 
And what's interesting about these things, so you have this Coulomb of repulsion of the vortices, because all the vortices in this magnetic field have the same circulation. And so the low energy state, you, you have to have some number of vortices to satisfy the frustration conditions. So the magnetic field here is acting like a yeah, chemical potential for vortices. But at the same time, they're repulsive and long range have long range repulsion. And so we know we get some sort of bigger crystallization in the system. This forms a lattice of vortices. But only if the flux values are commensurate with the, with the lattice. Right? So there's going to be certain values of flux where it achieves, and others where it's not commensurate. You can't actually satisfy the lattice conditions. This type of vortex lattice has been observed experimentally in other systems as a natural occurrence, like a type 2 superconductivity, and also in uh, Bose Einstein conferences that are spinning. There's some problems with this stuff. And let me highlight one of the biggest problems in these types of experiments. So if you have a vortex and you apply a current across that vortex, it moves. And uh, as anyone here played football, you know, when you put kick the ball and you put a lot of spin on it, it slides through the air perpendicular to its direction of motion. Right? That's the magnetic force. This magnetic force means that a circulating vortex, when the field is applied, wants to move laterally. And so when I apply a current across this device to approach properties, I start trying to push the vortices like this. Pushing the vortices causes face slips. They actually kind of try and hop around. And that heats the system. And so when they did these experiments, they couldn't see many of these commensurate face values because trying to measure it was too invasive. But in addition to this vortex motion, there's also just what you might consider the low wavelength or long wavelength excitations of the circuit, little fluctuations in spins. These are called spin waves. Again, if you look at the cosine of this difference in flux, you can think of this as the long wavelength derivative of the, of the flux field, where it looks like a free field. And that's going to give us these long wavelength excitations. But these long wavelength excitations depend upon where the vortices are. Because the effective sort of density or local spring constant is a function of this cosine, which has some overall discrete value that's been set to. So each of these inductors is set to not the same inductance, but some variation of the inductance because of the persistent currents running in the system already. So the insight of the group that the effort I'm about to tell you about came by trying by connecting this spin wave picture with the vortices to try and solve the heating problem. And so how do we do it? Well, instead of measuring the current in DC, we're going to take these types of systems and put them in the circuit QED architecture, put them inside the panel, and probe them with microwave photons up to 10 gigahertz. But not a lot of microwave photons, in fact, less than one microwave photon. We can get away with it because even one microwave photon has a very strong interaction. The vacuum body coupling is about 100 megahertz. And so even a single photon is more than sufficient to dramatically change properties of the array. So here is the device, uh, actual device, there's a micrograph of it. This is a collaboration with Yasuna Nakamura's group uh, in Japan at the University of Tokyo. Actually, in my entry slide, I have a picture of this little dowel looking object that is the part of the University of Tokyo. So, <laughs> and it's a clock tower. But, um, but the point is I have this here a copper cavity. Like, that's going to be my superconductor cavity. Um, and then I have a piece of dielectric with the Joseph Junction Array fabricated on with two large pads. We kind of zoom in at the 5 micron scale. We have these islands with four Joseph Junctions with little link links right here. And this looks like a resonator coupled to some unknown impedance set by this array. And so if I probe the transmission or the reflection coefficient of this resonator, so here's the reflection coefficient of the resonator as a function of frequency, I see the resonance. This is for no external field. And if I put some external field on, I see that the resonance can move. Why is the resonance moving? It's moving because this array leads to a change in the effective impedance. And I can see that effective impedance. This provides a very sensitive measure of what's happening in this system in a very narrow range of frequencies. So the benefit of this is that there's going to be very, very little heating. It's all virtual transitions at the single photon level. In these measurements, there's less than one photon in the cavity at any given time. The challenge 
is that you have to be able to track what's happening at 10 gigahertz and know from them what the macroscopic properties of the array are. So that's a challenge that we have to address theoretically. So now I'm going to get a little bit technical. How do we do it? Well, we essentially take the full potential energy landscape of this array. We're going to do it in a 3 by 30 setting, so it's quasi 1D. It makes it a little easier. You minimize that, and you expand about that minimum. Those expansions is quadratic expansion that provides harmonic oscillation. Those are the spin waves. So you can calculate the spin wave spectrum, and then you can calculate the spin wave impedance relative to the cavity, and actually Here's a calculation of how the cavity responds for a given probe frequency as a function of the flux per plaque, so the external field going through the system. And here is a theoretical prediction of the circulation parameter in that array. So you see here there's no circulation then at just over 1 over 90. That's when you get the first one flux per plaque. Yeah, you've got the addition of one circulation. And that shifts dramatically the response of the cavity. Then you have two. This is only two, but there's a lot going on here. Right, so I want you to look at this example so you can see in a moment a much more complex scenario. What's going on? So let's look at all the spin wave modes. Here's the spin wave spectrum that you can calculate. Here's the cavity frequency in that red line. So at zero flux, you have this transmon like mode and then a bunch of higher frequency modes. At one flux, the transmon mode changes dramatically. You have this set it down here, that's much closer to the cavity resonance, so that shifts the cavity more, that's a much stronger impact. Here you have a series of interesting little features showing up, each of which can be cutting through the cavity frequency. So when it cuts through the cavity frequency, you get this curved shape where it goes off one side and comes off back in the other. That's because the vacuum lobby is larger than you can see on the plot here. This is only uh, 100 megahertz here, the vacuum lobby is about 200 total. What's going on here is that you actually have the vortices kind of moving in next to each other via magnetic compression. And so, even if so it's still two vortices, but it's not necessarily stable. Right? They can move around. And that instability makes a lot of effectively noise in the spectrum. So, all that said, here is the most exciting plot of the day, at least for me. The top here is the cavity response for the experiment done by the Japanese group. And the middle and the bottom are the theory predictions that we were able to make with no fitting parameters. So we got parameters from experiments by a test experiment, which didn't have the array, it just had a single junction in it, in order to know what the capacitances were and what the cavity frequency is and, and things of this nature. And we put the array in and then calculate what to get. And we get, I would say, for no fitting parameters, pretty good agreement between these two. You'll see, for example, this is flux per plaquette from 0 to 1. So it should be periodic at 0 to 1. That's roughly speaking what we see. It should flip about a half. Again, that's roughly speaking what we see. At a half, we expect some ordering because I have every other site you get a vortex in. Now I'm making my slabs. But also you expect ordering at a third, as a label here, at, and at a sixth, at a ninth, which I didn't really label, but there's a little bit of feature there. And so our goal is to understand how the low frequency stuff, which is this vortex ordering, impacts what you can observe in the cavity. So here's the spin wave spectrum to go with this transmission spectrum. And the spin wave spectrum has some interesting features at these points, like you see that there's the emergence of some gap-like behavior at particular areas in the system, that is because when you have a lattice, you have essentially a ordered array of inductors, and that gives you a block here. Because I have a repetition of some super lattice, which is larger, and that block here introduces a band. So we think the generic feature of the lattice in microspectroscopy is the emergence of banded structure that persists over some range of flux. That's the hypothesis. You can kind of dive in on that and look at what happens at Here's a calculation on the theory side at a, at a half and then decreasing the flux a little bit towards four nines. Here is actually the experimental data in that range. You see that every time I take one vortex out, I have a, a, a sort of blip in my response. And then at this point around here, which corresponds to about this point here, we start to get disorder, if you will, in theory simulation. And we also get some disorder, if you will, in experiments. 
where we don't really we have a lot of anticipation occurring in the system. That's why you can't see a lot of features here. And then over here, which is, this is another interesting case, this is one sixth. So here you actually have one per six sites. And you start increasing the magnetic field, and then you get a new defect that shows up. Here's where the quasi 1D nature of the system, this is 3 by 30, starts to play a role. This looks like a structural phase transition, where I start to pop vertically. And this has an icing like character to it. We can't extract critical exponents. In this case, the system isn't large enough. But our speculation is that this also represents a certain type of phase transition. We can also look at a larger system, in this case, a 100 by 100 array, and look for these BKT transitions that we mentioned by looking at the damping of the microwave response. Because if, if the vortices are allowed to move around, in the unbound case, you get a lot more damping than if they're bound, then they're hard to move and you get much less damping. So we see preliminary evidence for that. Uh, here is the damping line width of the observed response as a function of the temperature uh, compared to the adjustment energy. We also see the beginning of some pretty strong quantum effects in the sense that the EKT transition temperature is reduced dramatically if you, if you have a smaller EJ and larger kinetic term. So the kinetic term in these systems, the charge term, is the thing that adds quantum mechanics to the problem rather than just the classical XY model. And we do see a pretty dramatic change as you decrease this EJ to the point that you actually, even at very low EJs, you can't even see the EKT transition at all. And it's also well, it should have lined right on top of each other if, if they were both the same transition, but because of kinetic fluctuations, we think that's what's going on. So this is kind of neat. This is the first evidence in this experiment that you saw some really quantum, not just a little bit quantum. Okay, so that actually took most of my time. I have about 10 minutes left. I hope that you understood a little bit about vortices, vortex arrays, probing them using circuit QED formalism. We can take this further. So here's another type of object, a Joseph injunction and an inductor. This is called a Fluxonian qubit. So in this Fluxonian qubit, you have, here's my potential energy landscape as a function of flux. I have from the inductor a overall parabolic confinement. And then from the Joseph term, I have this cosine behavior. And this is no longer 2 pi periodic because the charge is not conserved because you have this inductor. But we can still identify this, this case here, this case here is here having a phase slip, here not. This you can think of as a overall circulation in this loop. And here there's no circulation in the loop. So no vortex, vortex. What's interesting is that I can also have the spin of excitations. I've shown the spin of excitation energies here. So this is the ground state, first excited state, second excited state, third excited state. And I can line up a no vortex some number of photons, here would be three, with one vortex no photon. And I can get tunnel between these two states. So you can get photon assisted tunneling of vortices. In this particular case, we use this to create a very special three body interaction between the photons. <coughs> so you can tune this up so that there's no two body interaction, no only a three body interaction, which is quite a bit of fun actually, because given that, you can uh, use some techniques really designed by Sean Bifan. So here we go, this, this paper right here, showing how in a time-dependent system with many different time-dependent couplers, I can implement a synthetic magnetic field, as Moon Sega has done in lateral waveguides, and then Roman Hefezi did in optics here, you can do also time-dependently. So this type of time-dependent approach is very effective in the microwave domain, which is very good, efficient, 99.9% .9 efficient time-dependent couplers. And so you can take this to make a magnetic, effective magnetic field, you add a three-body interaction, magnetic field plus three body interaction plus one last piece, which is some number of particles, and you can get fractional quantum Hall states out. In particular, the function state can be the ground state of the system, if only you can get to the right number of photons. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to gesture towards our approach to getting these photon-assisted, photon-vortex interaction terms to really make a new state of matter. One that has been conjectured, is often type fractional quantum Hall state, but here for bosons. And so the missing piece is not only do we need to do the interactions, not only do we need to find the field, I'm not going into detail, but I understand the what is here that you probably understand that basic concept. But how do I get the system to have a thermodynamically large number of photons? 
because there's no chemical potential for photons. Right? Photons, they famously don't have a chemical potential. They were happily absorbed by the walls of the cavity. Because they don't deserve a photon number. And I, to address this problem, we look back to the basic concept of thermalization, which is if I have a system, small, fat, large, and a weak coupling between them, and I go to the long time limit, and I take the coupling to be very weak, and so if A to bath, they take it off to zero, and if the bath starts from the thermal state, I find that the system, after tracing over the bath, is described also by thermal state. That's thermalization. There's some key assumptions, you can go to those in this PRE. But that's actually, it turns out to be pretty broadly applicable. This is separate from the eigen state thermalization hypothesis. This is an open system problem, not a closed system problem. But I don't want this, because remember, I, I want a chemical potential. This doesn't have a chemical potential. So what do I do? I make the coupling time. <coughs> I make the coupling oscillate in time. Because I have a large bath in a small system, it turns out that the power produced by this can be absorbed in the bath without directly impacting the system. That's good. And in the appropriate limits, if the bath is, has only low frequency excitations, I can make what's called a rotating wave approximation and move to a rotating frame. So I get a fictitious potential term. This is what leads to fictitious forces, like Coriolis force and centrifugal force, from the rotation. Here, that centrifugal force term is h bar nu times the sum of the number of photons. I get a system math problem in the rotating frame. And then this will thermalize, I'm sorry about the overlap here, thank you for my point. Uh, and this will then thermalize to the system minus this additional term here under the same conditions that this thermalizes. And so you recognize this as a grand phenomenon ensemble, where h bar nu is playing the role of chemical potential. What's really happening is that the pump is a photon, effectively a photon number conserving bath for the photons. So it's photons being added or subtracted from the pump. <coughs> if the pump gets depleted, that approximation will break down. Right? So you need a sort of undepletable pump. Fortunately, photons are pretty cheap. A microwave pump has a lot of photons in it. So we're not so worried about the photon depletion at the present time. But this, another way to think about this is that I have a low frequency bath and up and down converting it to the system. Of course, there's also some additional losses in the system, so I'm not going to get exactly thermodynamic equilibrium. In fact, we have to use some more of a Landauer type formulation of the problem. We have two chemical potentials and finite bias, and sort of current flows through the system. But I'm not going to get into that. In fact, I'm probably not going to get into any of the rest of it, like how you actually do it. There's some beautiful experiments in this group showing how we can add a bath to our system in a control panel. And, and the key thing here is that we went through all this effort to use superconductors because they're really decoupled <coughs> from the resistive environment and they live a long time. But the problem is that I also, if I want a large bath to dissipate a lot of heat into, I need something to, to capture it. And so what we're, what we're pursuing there is adding a bath by adding some <coughs> semiconductors. Not because semiconductors are good conductors, but because semiconductors have strong coupling to phonons. And the density of states of phonons is 10 to the 15 orders of magnitude greater than the density of states for photons. Because the speed of sound is 10 to the 5 times slower. So you can have really big baths in your mind. Now in the superconductor, the phonons integrate out, right? They're part of light superconductivity. But in the semiconductor, the phonons are there to play a role for thermalization. And so we can use them as our effective path. <coughs> and all we have to do is figure out a way to make the coupling of the phonons in the superconductor time dependent. We do that by having a, a, it's called a double quantum dot. Here's a semiconductor system that can charge you the left side and the right side, and it can move back and forth. That's a dipole. So I can use circuit QD to couple this dipole. The dipole couples to the phonons. I can drive the dipole with electric field so it oscillates, then it's time dependent, and that ends up making a time dependent coupling to the phonons. I'm out of time, so I'm going to leave that at that point and skip forward a little bit. <coughs> And I'm going to take now the most important part of the talk, which is to say that this is the work of many people. And I want to highlight, in particular, a few people who, for whom this work is, is really the main story. And, and first, let's talk about the group in Tokyo. Uh, Raj Kosnick, Hiroki Ikigami, and Yasunobu Nakamura, 
who did just an incredible job. I do not have great pictures of him, unfortunately. I only showed you beautiful data, not beautiful people. I'm sorry. I also want to highlight uh, Brittany Richmond, who's working on the theory of that with me, uh, and then Chao Song Wang and Michael Gollins, who are working on the theory of these time dependent systems, along with Jason Pettis Group, who's been helping actually implement these things. I will leave you there and inquire for your questions. Thank you. When have we done Right, so the question is when, when so I have this. Two, two levels, so, so the question is when I have this, this loop, and if, if the, for the circulating current, um, uh, what values is it allowed to do? So the flux going through the loop is fixed. I completely agree. How much current I get depends upon EJ. Because the, the relationship. What's right? Yeah, so, so the, the, vor the vorticity is quantized in integer values, for sure. But the amount of current is not. Because the current depends upon the Joseph energies, and they're not all the same. So, uh, but in practice, by the way, the currents in those loops are in the order of my point. So my point here, the problem is my point here. Uh, the good agreement between the classical theory and the children is actually quite far from the quantum regime. Where the yeah, so uh, the experiments that I showed you were done with this EJ of PC at about uh, 2.5. Whereas in the DKT transition, we see a very bad agreement at about 0.5. And pretty good agreement at about uh, 2.5. So did you go into the opposite box regime? The so we, we, have, we have some data in this lower EJ regime. But we're looking for some additional checks because what has starts to happen in this regime is not only to get spin wave response, we also get strong vortex response. And so we want to disambiguate vortex response and spin wave response. So we need a, a, a four port device to do that. So the problem is not to try and make capacitance low? No, the problem is simply that we don't have the right observables with the cavities that we set we have right now. So we can only measure, we can't, we can't separate out vortex and spin wave response right now. But they, one has a sort of all connectivity and the other just not. So we can separate them with a four point device, but we don't have that in this room. I, I'm not reporting on that yet. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, then.